the T in the bottom of the glass. We can only go where political leaders count the cost, make the decision, and go all in. We can't go elsewhere. Wow. Wow. I don't know what, do you want to add to that? Mm. Okay. So, <laughs> because, I mean, we need such leaders. So when you go back, we need to be such leaders. That's first. We start with ourselves. Um, and then how do we spread that? You know, that's going to be my walk away from this conference is if what's holding us back is not having that, then we have to think about what are the generations to come. I think we have to, we have to get to a point where we're, we're willing to fight. If you want to fight, like the spirit and the, your commitment, I'm questioning, like, am I that commitment? I'm uh, committed to Africa as three of you. I think everybody in this room should ask themselves that question. Are you as committed? Right? Because if you are, maybe, 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 maybe that's the beginning of transformation for not just Rwanda, but for the rest of the continent. That's my own lesson. I'm, I'm taking that, I'm packaging that, and I'm going to chew on that for, for a couple of months. So questions? Okay, I'm going to hold. He was the first. <laughs> All right, thanks for the opportunity you know, to, ask, to ask this question. Um, it's actually three in one. Um, so my first is very short. So first question is, you know, it seems you're doing some very good work in Rwanda, right? Um, are you interested in expanding, or have you done similar work in other parts of Africa? Um, or are you interested in partnering with people who are interested in you know, doing some of what you're doing in Rwanda? That's the first question. Under, un, we only own the mill in Rwanda. We once owned a mill in another country where they changed the rules. Um, but we export for other people, local families and local businesses that run wet mills and dry mills. We're probably the largest exporter of fully washed specialty Arabica out of Ethiopia. We're the largest out of Uganda. We were in another country or two. We've, we kick-started this program where uh, Starbucks is buying coffee from the, uh, the DRC, that was our team that went in and built those wet mills and put up the initial finance. We do all this, I love his fruit grows on other trees. We do all this in the name of whatever business is local. But, but yes, we will partner if the three conditions are true. We will partner anywhere in Africa where there's product that outsiders want. All right, second quick question is, um, so I'm blanking out right now. Did huh? come without the successes that you've achieved in Rwanda with what you're doing, I believe did not come without any challenges or obstacles. So can you share some of the major obstacles that you've had, you know, to deal with to get to where you've, you know, got into? Uh, no. um, I, if you got me talking about it, I would weep. That's how tiring it was. Now, I told you a little bit about the conversation with my wife. That was real. You know, we may lose everything. That's how, that's how hard. We had to push I'd made a lot of money. We had to push it all in before this flywheel turned all the way around. It takes, not millions, it takes tens of millions of dollars to support this infrastructure across the 20 countries that we're in today. All right, we just got profitable in our ninth year of business. Right? So you tell me how many obstacles you want to know about. <laughs> Send me a note. I could cry you a river. All right. <laughs> and and, and for this last question, you probably don't have to answer. Maybe I'll, you know, talk to you on the side about it. But um, how do I become like one of you, you know, CEO, CEO, founder? Um, and and the, the idea being that, you know, it's easier for, it seems it's easier for guys like you to go to Africa, right, and be able to do the things that you're doing. For some Africans themselves, you know, it's not that easy. So what, what, what are some of the things that you need to do or prepare yourself for to be in the position that you're in? Thank you. Uh. So, um, <laughs> look, er everything that we have in Africa is run by Africans. So, you know, the general manager of our feed mill is African. The, the lady that runs all of our QA and our live production business, she's, I mean, read us from Rwanda. It's African. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think what is needed is capital to start a business trust to be able to trust people i mean look i'm i don't know how far are we from rwanda Ten thousand miles Eight thousand miles i got a 
28 year old young man, you know, you know r running a business on assets I paid for 8,000 miles away. Uh, that takes a lot of trust, but he's worth it. He's a great investment. He was well educated, and and I'd do it all again. And so I think the opportunity's there. Uh, I think you know Scott's made the point. The capital's available. They're just looking for a, a safe place to put it, with with a team that they can trust with a reasonable amount of risk. And if you're that guy that is trustworthy, faithful, you know, intelligent resourceful, innovative, with good interpersonal skills, why can't you do it? You know, being an entrepreneur, building a business anywhere is really, really hard. It's hard in the States. And, and people come out of school wanting, you know, if somebody would just give me the money, I'd be so successful. <laughs> well, that, that people say that in the United States, too. So it's the same issues. So find, find a existing business that you can go to work for and learn the business. You know, save your money. You know, start a business on the side. Take risks. Throw yourself into it. I mean, you had to do that in America. You have to do that in Africa. The, uh, the flip side is you don't have nearly as much competition in Africa. And so part of our role at British Rwanda is to facilitate as much of that as we possibly can to find American investors who want to get involved and mentor and coach and own these businesses and put up capital and bring expertise. But it's also to create, you know, a, a work site where people can come in and kick their ideas around and put them up on whiteboards and get advice and consulting and encouragement. A lot of it's just you need, you need to be in an environment where people are encouraging you to go for it. And we can create that kind of an environment. But you still got to do it. Right, right. So, Dale, um, you and I have had, you know, conversations offline about how Africans can engage the U.S. business community. You know, I talked about Washington, D.C., for a lot of African political leaders, last 20 years, they've built strong relationships in D.C. Great. <laughs> One of the things I realized is that the business community or the business leaders on the African continent have not partnered with the U.S. business community. And you've talked about what President Paul Kagame did. Would you be willing sure. to share a little bit about that, please, if you feel comfortable? Yeah. When we first, when Scott and I first met the president, uh, we actually had a great example from this Anglican bishop who just kept coming back and forth and making friends and inviting them back to Rwanda. And, and effectively, that's what what President Kagame and the Rwandan leaders have taught us is that everything's driven by relationships, everything. And the president told us early on that he had made the decision and he had been advised, don't spend a lot of time in Washington. You need to go focus on business leaders, university leaders, church leaders. You need to build a network of friends around the world and invite them to come into your country and figure out how to come alongside you and help. Um, we went through a period from about, right after we met the president, there was a three or four year period where uh, Scott and a number of other friends of Rwanda, it was like a competition to see who could, who could introduce Paul Kagame to the coolest person. <laughs> You know, and they were CEOs, and they were Rick Warren, Still and they were presidents. Right. <laughs> but it was, um, you know, you would have never, you never would have thought how significant that was, but it was enormously significant. Absolutely. And and the the network of friends that Rwanda has is one of its great competitive advantages. Absolutely, and so. What we're, the conversation we're having here is so important because it, I'm going to give Albert, I know you have a question, from his data points, right, it's so clear that the, the trajectory, right, but what people don't know is what did the president do, and that's what you're sharing with us. You're, you're, you're really unveiling what the secret sauce is. And the reason, that, and thank you for sharing, right, because I want other countries represented here to take that back that this is what it takes. Yeah, so really key on that, and, and it's not only, not only did he form this Presidential Advisory Council to get information. What did he do that in our eyes, because every piece of information we gave him, we already knew. 
What did he do in our eyes that changed the dynamic? Twice a year, he was willing to be held accountable by people who were watching the regulatory policies, the law, the tax, uh, the corruption. He was willing to sit in a room twice a year and say, give me all you got that's not going right, and let me go back to work on six months, wow. right? That accountability from the head of the country, you know this in, in, in a corporation, you know, everybody says, what makes a great CEO? The willingness to hear the bad news and the desire to hear it early. That's it. Everything else is, everything else in a book is crap. That's it. He was willing to do that. So therefore, guys like us could say, okay, we know how to partner with that. Thank you. Uh, I've got a follow-up question on that. Uh, how can you guys help convince uh, other African governments to see the transformation that you have helped uh, take care of in Rwanda? Is there a way you guys can be maybe the voice? for other African leaders to hear. I, you're talking to the guy who just uh, took a plant apart and put it in trailers and shipped it out of a country because they won't have the discussion and they just create a law. So here's the new law, this governs everything, no industry associating meetings, no, no process to hear the, the rules, to hear the impact of the rules, just this is the new rule, comply immediately. I comply by taking a saline torch to the plant, putting it in uh, container ships and driving it to Rwanda. I hope he gets the message. You know, that's, my, that's all I know to do. All I have is the little bit to decide over we have. Yeah. You know, um, it, I also want to, could we get a mic? He raised his hand. Um, I would also say that, that we aren't the best people to influence African political leaders. <laughs> wow. Paul Kagame and the example of Rwanda is what motivates Africans and African leaders. So, you know, you can, you know, you need to underplay the role that we've had here. I mean, we got called into a great opportunity to have a lot of fun and have a lot of purpose and rewards. But everything that's happened in Rwanda is because of the Rwandan leaders and Rwandan people. And they're the model. And, and it's encouraging to me the fact that, you know, the president, uh, Kagame, became the head of the AU. And they've just been able to make this big, you know, intercontinental trade deal is that I don't think he got into this role uh, because people aren't noticing what's going on in Rwanda. First of all, let me thank, let me thank you all for this wonderful panel. This is probably the highest commitment to Africa panel I've heard in a long time. <laughs> and I want to thank Toin for really treating us to this delight. It's, it's wonderful, it's, it's wonderful. I have one question, which is, you know, it's probably God's work to bring all of you together. But I'm sure you're not alone. How can we make sure a network is created around like-minded people like you in the USA, not only not Western Arkansas, but, but in the USA, to actually take the work you're doing, the fantastic work you're doing, to the next level. So, can I, that's a great one. Um, if, if somebody could help me take note of that. David, please, can you help me take note of that? I'm gonna say this, I think I've said it in private with you. Dale is the most influential, connected person I know in the world. Amen. Donnie, I can trust you about it all. He doesn't say it. He doesn't say it. He's very, like, you know, quiet about it. But I know. I just want you to know I'm watching you. We can do it. We can do it. Behind, so behind each of them is wealth of information, experience, but a strong network. Donnie ran the world's one first or second largest poultry business in the world. He knows everybody in that business. What I would love to do is, how can we tap into that network and point it in the right country that is ready? We know what's working in Rwanda, but we want to see serious players, serious countries. We have, you know, one of the things I, I, I told someone privately, but I'll share it just to encourage people, I said, I don't have a name or a title to my name, right? 
I'm not dangled. I don't know. I don't, you, don't, you didn't all have to do this. But I said, if one person can pull this off, any president in Africa can pick up the phone and surely do much more than has been done here. And I also said, and I also said that Africa has everything it needs available in the world. There's no new innovation or anything you need. Everything is available. This is a small world. Mm. This is a small world. Everything a country in Africa needs, the blueprint, the expertise, the willingness, the, the focus, the funding, everything is abundant. We just need visionary leaders. We need to create a network. And as you've heard them, we need commitment. We need people to commit and invest, and not just for a short term, to be in it for the long haul. And what we, we have to, we absolutely, I'm so grateful you're here <laughs> because you're World Bank, you have a whole lot of network, but I'm saying the stakeholders were not on the same table and that's why we came together. The work continues after this event, for me at least, and I hope for you all. What's next? How can we partner? And please comment on that because behind them is a strong network of everything you need in agriculture, everything in my finance, everything in, in export, import, because what you've done for coffee, we can, we can just copy that sesame seed, cashew. You know, West Africa produces probably, I don't know, 30, 40, or maybe even 50% of the cashew in the world, but it's exported raw into Southeast Asia and imported into the US. With Agoa, you process it on site, bring it into the US, the buyer pays less, all of that. Yep. We, need to, we need to take what you've done and, and just apply it elsewhere. I'll be a broken record, because it's what I do. <laughs> uh, there was a kid that lived uh, from a West African country that lived with us during his high school and, and college years. And he used to say, he had a little bit of a French accent, and he says, Rwanda, 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 it's a tiny country. I'm sick of hearing about it. And I said, I understand. I get it. And he goes, so he vents. And he comes back in a little bit and he goes, why, why? Which I thought was a great opportunity to say, <laughs> it's really three things. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the rule of law equally applied, zero corruption, and reasonable regulatory policy. And I said, go to your home country. Go see the man at the port. Ask him, if I brought a container of coffee down out of the mountains, could I get it out without bribing him? He said, of course you can. I said, go ask him. He comes back, you cannot. <laughs> you, I mean, knew him, right? He said, you cannot. And I said, right, I have to comply with FCPA everywhere we go. We have to train everybody in our company every year on FCPA, which is fine. I don't make the laws, but I do live by them. And as an American, we have to live by it. So it's really, it really is... It's that hard, and it's that simple. Wow. So we're all listening to this, right? Because, um, you know, one of the narratives, people say we want trade, not aid. Right? Right? That's it. So if we really want trade, we're listening to the experts here, and they've told us what it takes, right? Um, and, and one of the, the stories, I try to use analogies to, to kind of help people see what I'm trying to communicate. I say, if you're in an African market, or you're going to the market to buy fish, I'm the buyer. And I see the first, there are five you know, fish sellers, and I go to the first one, and their fish stinks. What do I do? I move on. And the next one doesn't treat me well. <coughs> what do I do? I move on. And the next one feels, oh, I don't need your money. What do I do? That's the world, way the world works. And that's what I'm also hearing you say, capital flows in if you get it right. So we all have work to do. We have to go back. We have to take this. We have to hear this, and it's really strong. I love, because where else would you go where people are this open and direct? Where else would you go? Um, but. But all, we have to stay committed, and, and this is the real work we have to do. Um, there's no way around it. Oh, wow. Okay. 
Scott, my question's for you. One of the things that you said that I found intriguing was that you wanted to pay the coffee growers as much as possible. Uh, when I think of international trade and about companies from the United States and Europe going abroad, that's not a strategy that seems to be the norm. The, the focus is, even if you look at offshoring today, is to move from India to a lower cost country to a lower cost country so we can get the greatest margin out of the people doing the work for the corporation that's receiving the efforts of their labor. What made you create a strategy of trying to pay the coffee growers as much as possible from West Rock Coffee versus a standard corporate strategy that, I, that we see executed by most of the large corporations in the world? Sure. Well, I, I'm not here to throw any large corporation under the bus, and here's why, because I used to run one, and I actually know the trade-offs they have to make. What we're talking about, and, and, and frankly, the trade-offs they have to make are, are unfathomable in the modern world. And, and I think, frankly, for the most part, the vast majority get it right most of the time. Here's the issue, though. When you're talking about um, small plot farmers, we're not talking about someone who's going to work in a factory for $8 versus 7 or 6 versus 10 or in a call center for 12 versus 14, right? That's just, those are, those are, you know, that's the finishing touch. We're talking about people, whether, we're talking about whether or not at the, and, and you've, you've laid out the numbers uh, better than I could. Uh, you're talking about people on the margin who are trying to keep their children alive. Now, I'm not a public company, but, and, and therefore, I am not paid by shareholders to maximize the profit. Oh, we always maximize profit within the, bo the bounds of putting our own head on the pillow at night and having no regrets. That was the basic rule. How do we drive the most return and everybody gets to go home at night, put their own head on the pillow and say, I was asked to do only what was logical, fair, and reasonable today. I feel good about it. So we apply that test. But look, the public markets wouldn't have put up what, with what my wife put up with for nine years. There's no way on earth. They just said, let's roll it all in. Don't make a profit. Take nothing out. Go without pay. Just roll it. Keep pushing it. Why? Because rubies are everywhere. I don't expect a corporation to live to that, nor, nor do I think it would be a, a, a fair uh, comparison frankly. Okay. Unless they're, unless, hold on, <laughs> unless they're buying from smallholder farmers. I wasn't the first guy to get there and see that model. And at that point, I'm going to stop. <laughs> but, but if you want to talk later. <laughs> okay, first of all, um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Toyin for uh, making this happen. And to all of you just sitting out there, um, I guess Ronnie, Scott, and Dale, you guys have done something that, I don't know, the average person would really find it hard to do. But I, sitting in this room, I believe there's so many people that want to do something about this, but don't know how to do it or where to start. But I would say that beyond the conversations, are you guys open and maybe uh, Toyin can also lead us to develop maybe like a mentoring platform where some of your knowledge, you know, you can begin to mentor a few of I mean, people that are interested. You can put whatever criteria together to filter it because I know your time is valuable as well. But I'm just thinking, how do we make some of these conversations more tangible in the other countries or in the other uh, arena where people already work around the room? Thank you. Dale, that's a question for you. <laughs> um, you know, our answer to people who, who ask us those kind of questions is, you need to get on an airplane and you need to fly to Africa. And you need to go meet people and you need to see the needs that are, are obvious and available. And God will tell you what you need to be sticking your finger in and what you need to be trying to fix. And it could be, you know, it could be making loans to small entrepreneurs. It could be bringing health care. It could be bringing schools. I mean, the, you know, we, Africa has a run out of needs. But you have to go see them. And you won't know exactly what you're supposed to do until you go and see it. And somebody touches your heart and says, you got enough to invest in that. Whether it's your time, your, you know, whatever it is. But you have to see it. You have to know it. 
And, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not a real big believer in structures or big organizations and stuff. I just believe get on a plane, go meet people, go see the problems, and do what you're called to do. You've been given more than most people who have ever, you know, if you live in America, you have more than almost any other human beings that have ever lived on this planet, regardless of what economic level you're at. Let me tell you, go to Africa, God will call you to pull some time, some money, some resources out and address an issue. Okay. Well, my name is Dennis. Uh, I'm actually from Rwanda. And I feel less Rwandan hearing all the panel being passionate about Rwanda. I feel more informed and probably challenged to be more passionate about my country. I had the opportunity to come to this country indirectly benefiting from British Rwanda. So I'm really grateful for what you did, Dale. Uh, I'm also good friends with people working at the feed mill in Rwanda, so grateful for that as well. My question is about the role of the diaspora in engaging the trade with Africa. Uh, should I move back to Rwanda or is there value in me staying here and adding value in some way? What role do you see the diaspora playing in uh, accelerating the trade uh, with Africa? I need you to go be the coffee buyer. <laughs> pick, a, pick a retail brand, go be the coffee buyer. You know, you know my answer, Dennis, is, is get on a plane and go back and get a job and start a business. And, you know, what you have been given, the experience that you have had here in the United States is, is will, you know, you have a competitive advantage to deliver something valuable there. And they need your talent and they need your life more than they need your money. Okay? Now... <laughs> You know, you have to figure out the timing of that. You have to figure out how you're going to work on there. You know, I'll help you find a job. I'll help you partner with you. But the reality is get in the game. Wow. Somebody should tweet that. Get in the game. <laughs> I was going to say, you want to run a hatchery? <laughs> hey, uh, you want to run a seed production business? Uh, you want to run a farm services and agriculture extension business, uh, seed distribution business. Uh, we can think of several. So, run a washing station. Call Katie. <laughs> okay, we have a question right here. Oh, 